That's good. Thank you. Uh, you know, um, I would like the films, as you know, is a deeply are a deeply collaborative art. So I'd like to ask all the folks who are involved in the making of this to come up also. Um, I want to say a particular thanks to CNN Films, who have been just magnificent throughout this entire process. It's taken a long time. They've been very patient and very supportive. Jane Mantellis, Vinny Malhotra, and um, uh, Courtney Sexton, and Jeff Zucker, and everybody at CNN Films have been great. This is quite a team here. Yeah. yeah. There's Viva Van Loop, the producer. <laughs> Mike Palmer, co-producer and editor. Stacey Offman, executive producer. Nick Gibney, animation. Um, Gabby Darbyshire, executive producer. Will Bates, composer. Paramonis, associate producer. Alexis Johnson, associate editor. Aaron Barnett, editor. And Peter Elkham, co-producer. So yeah, big team. It takes a, takes a goal. Well, thank you. This is extraordinary film. Um, maybe we should just start by you uh, talking about the origins of this project and what, uh, where this came from, why you were attracted to this story, and, and where, where it went for you. I mean, I, I think the origin of it is in the film, in the sense that I, I was struck by this idea of, of the enormous public grief. It's perfectly understandable for those who knew Jobs closely, but the enormous public grief over Jobs, and it just set me reflecting on, on that, like why so much for this particular person. And, and I think it's because, you know, and, and the film was a way of trying to understand that issue. Um, you know, he was very much a counterculture figure, some just a hair younger than I was. And so I was interested in, in kind of tracing that. And the, the structure of the film, in a way, was, uh, in my own you know, ham-fisted way, a, a kind of structure not unlike sort of Citizen Kane, where Citizen, uh, there have been a lot of Citizen movies lately, but anyway, Citizen Jobs dies and you go back and you find people, like in that movie, and you just find people who illuminate a point of the story. I didn't really want to do a, um, a cradle-to-grave biography because I felt there was so much to talk about, it would have been a stone-skipping exercise. So there's a lot that is skipped over, but I felt that by focusing on a few key people and a few key moments, that might uh, illuminate some things about, some stuff about Steve and Apple that hadn't really been talked about. I, I have some experience doing stories about Apple and Steve Jobs, and um, I would describe that if you're not doing the story that they want, that, that relationship to me was uh, adversarial, even threatening, um, borderline threatening. What was the, what's, what, what, did, what was their response to this film? Um, did, I assume they didn't cooperate directly with you. How did you guess that? <laughs> uh, I will. Um, I will try to get. I will try to um, quote directly what they said when uh, Viva approached them originally. They said, um, "We don't have the resources to be able to help you in this project." So that is a message for everybody. I know Apple is the most valuable company in the world, but if you have any extra money. I would send it their way so they have the resources to help people so, with <laughs> actual reporting. Yes. Yeah, with actual reporting. Um, talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the Lisa story. Um, that does seem, um, I think Michael Moritz says in the film, it's one of the most telling aspects of his life, or at least in his view. What did you, what do we learn from that? What did you learn from that? Well, throughout the film, you can see these enormous issues that Steve has with paternity, both taking, um, and, and I think, um, the idea that he was an orphan, um, and, and I think it was Daniel Kotke who says he was a, he was he both felt rejected and felt special all at the same time, um, and I think that uh, and in that Lisa story, it was so cruel and so odd that he would sort of deny paternity and yet at the same time turn it into one of his products. Um, so those those contradictions and also that that kind of um, deep affection for how he put himself into his work and his machines, and yet his kind of staggering lack of, of empathy yeah. for, for other human beings seemed very telling. And also, I think, as Mike Moritz says, the idea, as with many driven and powerful people, the idea that he could do something like that and get away with it, which flashes forward to some of the, to the later stuff. 
his story falls into these really distinct chapters. There's this kind of rise in the early Apple with the Apple II, uh, this kind of period of time in which he's kicked out of Apple, uh, which people call the kind of wandering in the wilderness period. And then, this, of course, this kind of triumphant rise at the end. Is there, is there a part of that that you felt most kind of moved by or interested in? Well, I, I think he did learn some things along the way. You, you know, he's an interesting character because I think one of the reasons he was so successful and one of the reasons we remember him is that he was a great storyteller. And he told this great story about technology. But the other thing that Steve Jobs knew was that to be great, you have to surround yourself by a great team. And, um, and it, you know, it sort of reminded me, I, uh, um, last year I did a film about James Brown. It struck me that there's a lot about Steve Jobs that's a lot like James Brown. We all remember James Brown, but nobody remembers the members, nobody remembers the people in the band. Well, those guys were awesome musicians, and Brown knew that he had to surround himself, his, surround himself with them. Brown also was not, you know, was a, a, a tough, some would say deeply unsympathetic character off the stage, but he was the front man that everybody remembered and everybody responded to. But the only way it worked was to surround himself by extraordinary people. And that's one of the things about Apple that I think people forget. You know, everybody focuses on Jobs as if he kind of single-handedly built this company twice. It was, I think, by surrounding himself with extraordinarily talented people and pushing him hard that it made it work. I can't see the early part of your film, that blue box period, without thinking about this sort of crackdown we've had on programmers and hackers kind of recently. Uh, maybe that's just my take on it, but the kinds of things where they're, um, where, you know, I've talked to lots of people who have said, you know, we were phone freaking back then. We were doing these kind of tones uh, and, and doing this stuff. And they, and they look at that as this kind of, they, they cherish that part as a kind of create, uh, source of creativity. I think you even say in the film, there wouldn't be an Apple without that kind of uh, pi pirate mentality. Um, that's, that seems gone to me. I mean, that seems like that's not that's no longer celebrated. That's clearly wiretap fraud, things like that. Do you want to have has they have? What's your perspective? Well, it may not be celebrated by the government. I think it's celebrated by a lot of other people. I mean, I, I think that that um, that kind of uh, you know, I think both in the Snowden episode and elsewhere, you know, uh, I, I don't think uh, that there are a lot of. <laughs> I think Edward Snowden has a lot of supporters, but I think you know the the flip side of it too is that. That renegade mentality, the pirate mentality, is an interesting thing when you're trying to upend things. It's a little bit different, the pirate mentality, when you're on top of the most powerful or the most uh, valuable corporation in the world. So I think that's, a, that's an element which is something I was thinking a lot about in this one. Um, one of the things I think your film does so well is it, it goes over some of these um, uh, the sort of the less savory aspects of what we've seen, you know, this, this major company go through. Um, uh, what, um, talk about this myth that you come to, this kind of willful ignorance we have, where we want to believe that, that something is what it is, and yet we, we're willing to look past some of this stuff, the Fox, Foxconn, the uh, stock backdating, things like that. Well, it's very difficult to confront it because, I, I mean, in my pocket, and like the ring, it's now my iPhone. Uh, I still have an iPhone, and so, you know, we like the products a lot, and we don't want to think about uh, where they come from or, or how the company is managing itself, a lot of these other things. But, you know, we live in an environment in a time where the planet may be dying because of what we're doing to it. So I think it's incumbent on us to begin to think about that stuff. And, I, and, and particularly, you know, one of the interesting things to me about making this film was when we think about Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley is no longer the place of the hacker. This is where the most powerful corporations on earth come from. And so we need to think about how that power is going to be utilized. And, and I think that that, I, you know, that's important. I know there's another film coming, so we should go to uh, questions. Does anybody have questions for Alex? Let's see. Yeah. Um... I was going to ask you a question about a sociopath, but I'm not. I'm going to ask you the question... Can everybody hear him? The question was going to be about the sociopath. But the question is, you kept asking about core values in the film. What do you think Jobs really thought were the core values of himself and his company? That's a pretty good question. So, so the question is, what, what, what does Alex think that the core values of Apple are after, after going through this story? 
And he keep, because Stop Jobs keeps coming back to this idea. Our core values are still there. But I think you rightly question, well, what, what's he actually talking about? Well, one of the reasons I spend so much time um, flicking back and forth between Silicon Valley and Japan was because I, I was trying to get out get at that. In other words, was there some spiritual value that he was seeking in, in Japan? And I do think there were moments based on the people that um, he knew that he would get closer to them in Japan somehow than, than he might otherwise do. And yet at the same time, I think what he got out of Zen was something very superficial. And it was kind of a, a kind of formal elegance. It, it's, it's almost like in the rock garden of Ryoanji, he would see the beauty of the design but not understand where that might take you in some sort of larger spiritual direction and not be able to connect you know, the idea of beautiful values in a product to how you might express those to other human beings. Uh, so I think you know, he believed that he was making the world a better place by making beautiful products, and that's it. That was his idea of simplicity. In other words, it ends at that. If you make good products, that's all you owe anybody, and you can stash your money in Ireland, and it's okay if you know, uh, you pay Chinese workers far less than they might be worth and so forth and so on. So I think his values stopped there. I think that was what he got from that Zen simplicity, the sense that we make beautiful products that people love and the story. There's something telling about that anecdote, I think she says, where enlightenment with ego, right, without sort of losing ego, there's something kind of uh, seemed right on about that. Well, she says that staggering thing, which I, which I have to <laughs> ask, you know, is it possible to say that Steve Jobs blew it? I mean, everybody recognizes him as the greatest entrepreneur of the 21st century. Um, but I think what, what she meant by that was that he, he didn't, after forging this great company, he didn't take with him that idea about really trying to make the world a better place. It's interesting that he would mock and vilify Steve, uh, Bill Gates throughout, throughout his career. We all sort of did. We did, and he was the, he was the bad guy. He was right. the empire, the evil empire. Well, look what Steve Gates is doing with his money now. He's, yeah, he's Bill helping, Gates. I'm sorry, <laughs> Bill Gates. <laughs> yeah. World changing yes. things. Yeah, he's, he he's changing. curing disease. He's, he is changing things. So um, the guy that Steve mocked is, is the guy who's really living those world transformative values. Uh, okay. Yes, Alex, I'd just like to say that another great film to your great lineage of uh, doctors that you've done. I saw the, your movie on Scientology a few nights ago, and I can't help but see a lot of parallels between this movie and Scientology. <laughs> so, can you kind of speak to that? And speak no, nobody can hear that, right? Right. Um, Alex's previous film is uh, about Scientology, so uh, he's asking about the comparison between huh. Scientology and Steve Jobs. <laughs> so what's this say not only about the individuals like L. Ron Hubbard and Steve Jobs, as, as big of individuals as they are, but what's this say about the human condition and that we buy into this yeah. kind of concept? Of okay, so how, how do you compare L. Ron Hubbard and Steve Jobs, and what's this say about us <laughs> or, that we buy into these people? Or David Massey. Well, I'm not sure I would take the comparison too far. Um, <laughs> I, I think that um, one thing I would say is that Steve Jobs and L. Ron Hubbard were both great storytellers. Steve, L. Ron Hubbard started off as a science fiction writer. But to, to one of your points, the idea about what about us, I, I do think that um, we like to have certainty in our lives. Life, modern life in particular, is very confusing. Um, and, uh, and there are a lot of centrifugal forces. And I think it's comforting to have a simple story and to have simple products that are easy to use. Um, and, and I think that is something that Steve Jobs was effective at selling to us. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm getting some kind of uh, cut it off soon motion. So, uh, um, all right, by the microphone. Yeah. Actually, I, go ahead and stand up to the microphones if you. Yeah, it's, maybe that's the I saw those. I thought it would be a great idea. Um, <laughs> earlier in the week, Tim Cook came out with a story that. He had the same, he was a tissue match for Steve Jobs' liver and offered before he uh, got the liver transplant from the other guy, from the 20 year old, that uh, he would, but Steve refused to give him, you know, to take part of his Tim Cook. Uh, I didn't hear that. So, so Tim Cook offered Steve Jobs That's his liver. liver. Well, part of his liver. Part of his liver. <laughs> I think if he offered him all of his liver, that would have been, a, uh, was, yeah. that would have been problematic. I actually didn't hear that. Um, so. do, you, do you have any idea why he might have done that? 
by Tim Cook would have done uh, by, it? Well, I can know why Tim Cook would have done it, but why would Steve Jobs refuse? I would not. Because he was gay. <laughs> no, I was about to make a joke, but I'm not going to. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, uh, I don't. The free spleens, anyone? Any, yeah. The microphone helps. Thank you. I have, I have a two part question. I apologize. Um, the last three films you've done, are all, I think, are all really spectacular and interesting. Um, what do you see in common between Lance Armstrong, Elliot Spitzer, and Steve Jobs? That's part one. Part two, <laughs> um, what was left on the cutting room floor that you kind of wish you could have kept it? Um, to part one, I can't answer that question. That's for you to decide. I, I have no idea what's in, <laughs> what's in common. I seem to be drawn to these figures. In any case, uh, in terms of most part two? Uh, oh, what's on the cutting room floor? On this, on this Man, floor. you should have seen our six-hour haiku cut. Um, yes. I, mean, I, I, think, I actually think that there is a lot that we left on the cutting room floor, and I, I think the, the story of Jobs and the story of our relationship with the computer, we, we would have liked to have made much longer, so maybe someday. Any other? Okay, we're in, we're in the back. You, yeah, in the half. Did you talk with, did you talk with Walter Isaacson, who wrote the, the uh, big book about? I talked with him briefly, but at the end of the day, you know, that that I, I kind of went my own way. Um, Walter wrote a very big, almost encyclopedic book, and he touched on all these things throughout. And, 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 I really didn't want to try to replicate that in any way, and that's why I, I took a very different approach. Yeah, yeah, all right. Uh, Steve Jobs had a twin, and I'm wondering if Mona Simpson that's right. uh, the, played any part in this. The writer Mona Simpson is, was surprisingly, as we learned that in the 90s, I think, right? Right. I, I reached out to Mona Simpson, but she declined to speak. There are a lot of people who declined to speak, in part, I think, because the, the film wasn't sanctioned by either Apple or Lorene Jobs. I reached out to Lorene Jobs very first thing. And actually, we were supposed to have a long phone conversation, then I got word back that uh, Lorene didn't want to talk and didn't want to be cooperative. Indeed, Lorene reached out to a number of people and either encouraged or pressured them not to talk. So it made my life a little bit more difficult, but I soldiered on. Oh, we got uh, one more question. What does this say about selfishness and narcissism? <laughs> what does this say about selfishness and narcissism? Well, I think the answer to that, I don't mean to be coy, but I think the answer to that is in the film. I mean, I think, um, uh, so, that's what I'd say. <laughs> There's a funny tweet going around this week that said, um, do you want to make... 10, 000, do you want to sell $10,000 gold watches to rich people, or do you want to come with me and change the world, right? Which echoes the, what Steve Jobs said to Scully. Do you want to, do you want to sell Pepsi for the rest of your life, or are you going to come with me? Where do you think, clearly, Apple's is not what it was now under Jobs. Do you have any thoughts about the future of Apple? Look, I think that Tim Cook has made some changes. Ma Jun, the, the Chinese activist, for example, says that he's done a better job in China than before, but you could see, you know, uh, their their money hoarding in Ireland and the weird financial games that they're playing. You know, I would hope that that they do a better job. Uh, the Think Different campaign, even as I watched it now, I mean, to see those people on the posters, Cesar Chavez, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, you know, I would say those aren't exactly the values of Apple. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Galaxy.